I'm going to miss saying this, but it's a brand new week and a brand new top 10. In fact, we're only going to say this two more times, so make the most of it. Who is the number one team in college football following rivalry week? And more specifically, who has the clear-cut pathway to make it to the college football playoff? If you are new here, welcome on into the channel. My name is Cole Thompson. I'm a radio show host based in Houston, and I talk college football daily. So if this is the type of content you enjoy, make sure you smash that subscribe button down below. Leave a comment telling me your thoughts on who deserves the number one spot, who's the most underrated team in the country. Tell your friends, your family, your sister, your brother, your mortal enemies, your best of bros, your church congregation, the past stock guy at a public's parking lot, everybody about this channel. We're on the race to 1,000. Then 1,000 turns to 5,000, 5,000 turns to 10,000, and 10,000 turns to 100,000. Thank you to all the new subscribers. Make sure you continue to tell people. And as always, let's continue to talk college football. As we do every single week, we do our honorable mentions to begin. I have five this week. I think that there is a clear separation between the top 10 and those on the outside looking in. No particular order. For starters, Louisville. Louisville handled its job throughout the regular season, but they did fall apart against Kentucky. And Kentucky, I think, showed you that their record isn't how good that they could be. They actually were just caught in a rock and hard place between several games. And Louisville kind of got lucky in several of those matchups where you saw them be able to pull away late to where another team couldn't respond. And they're decent, but they're not probably at that same level as what you wanted as a Missouri or a Ole Miss. Like if they were to meet up in the bowl game and at full strength at a neutral field location, I'd take both SEC schools over the Cardinals. But hell of a job in year one by Jeff Brom. Ten wins is almost impossible to think of, and he did so extremely well. And they're now playing for a shot to win in Charlotte against Florida State. Next up, Arizona. Arizona's got to be the feel-good story of the year, and Jed Fish is the coach of the year, in my opinion. What they've done from the start of the season after losing in overtime to Mississippi State to now is almost unheard of. They really are just a handful of plays away against, against the Bulldogs and against USC from playing in the Pac-12 title game. They're that good. They played up to everyone's standard. They beat up on other teams, and they handled themselves against Utah, very well-prepared team, and against Oregon State. Very well-prepared team. Jed Fish is not going anywhere, it seems. He'll be in Tucson for the foreseeable future. This is a team, if they can continue to keep as many players as possible in the building and also work the transfer portal in their favor, they're going to make headlines in year one as members of the Big 12. I have no doubt about it. Next up, LSU. Jaden Daniels is your Heisman Trophy winner. I'm done with this conversation. I'm done. Like as much as I love Bo Nix, as much as I regret, as much as I agree that Michael Penix belongs in New York City. Jaden Daniels was down by 10 in the second half and then woke up and chose violence. He found Malik Babers. He found Kyron Lacey. He found Brian Thomas, another very underrated wide receiver in college football. And they beat Texas A&M by 12 points. Momentum swing in the final 10 minutes of the third quarter until the game came to a close was all based off number five. And if that team had somewhat of a competent defense, they'd be playing in Atlanta this weekend and they'd have a shot of going to the college football playoff. And at that point, we wouldn't have an argument about where Jaden Daniels ranks in terms of college football playoffs best player. He would automatically be the front runner and probably the most unanimous decision we've had in a hot minute. Next up, Penn State. You beat the living doors and took your anger out on Michigan State. And good for you. You are a 10 and 2 team. 10 and 2 is not what you not what you aspire for, but it's enough for us to say, yeah, you were right on cue. You won every single game that you were supposed to, except for the two that you were supposed to at least be a little bit more competitive in. Uh, Drew Aller had a decent day. The rushing attack was fine. They're probably going to be representing somewhere in maybe a New Year's Six Bowl. And if not, that just shows you why there's probably expansion coming to the college football playoff. I don't agree that 10-2 and two should be the standard in state college, but you got the job done. What more can I say on that? And last, and unfortunately, I had to put them somewhere, Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma, I think, did a decent job of getting a win. I know that they were without their starting quarterback and Dylan Gabriel for most of the second half. Jackson Arnold did well. Uh, there's a very good shot that Arnold played maybe his last game as a member of the Sooners. More on that in another video we'll talk about with Jeff Levy higher. But 10-2 and two in year two, and you finished with a better record, but you lost to Oklahoma State. Like, that's really the difference about you not being back in Arlington this year. Uh, still, 10 and 2. I think a lot of people would take that in Norman, Oklahoma, after what happened, especially when you are seeing also those flaws that held you back underneath Lincoln Riley 
holding him back in Los Angeles. And you're making strides, at least on one side of the football with Brett Medibles, who is proven at this point to be a very good coach. Not a league coach, but good coach. Now let's move on to our top 10. Number 10, Ole Miss. Ole Miss, to me, has shown the ability to be consistent. That's why they come in for me at number 10. I like them. I like that they can run the football with Quinshawn Junkins. You're not asking Jackson Dart to always play hero, but he has multiple times this season. He's won through the air. He's won with his legs in the open field. He's kept drives alive. And the defense really has turned the corner at times underneath Pete Golding. Like, no, you didn't beat up on Georgia. Not many people do. You didn't beat up on Alabama. Not many people do. But you handled business against an LSU team. You handled business against Texas A&M. Yeah, were they high-scoring functions? Absolutely. But your offense came to play, and Lane Kiffin, I think, fits exactly what is needed in Oxford. Should he be looking for another job? If there's one available, I would immediately hire him. But right now, knowing the future of where Ole Miss is going and the future of college football, 10-2, and two, that's enough to get you in the college football playoff. Absolutely, they have earned their stripes, and they have earned their spot in New Year's Six Bowl. Number nine, Missouri. I give Missouri the nod because they played closer against Georgia than Ole Miss. But the separation between these two, if you want to flip them, I get it. I do. Brady Cook, resurgent season, absolutely phenomenal in what he was able to accomplish this year. Luther Burden, probably the most underappreciated wide receiver in college football because of how many good names there are. Cody Schrader, we got to talk about him real fast. The fact that he was not automatically a D1 athlete is baffling 217 rushing yards against the Hogs. That is impressive. On the road, I might add in, and you get a 48-14 win. I don't know if you will be New Year's Six eligible because the LSU game is what's really going to separate these two. LSU lost to Ole Miss, but they beat Missouri. Still, Eli Drinkowitz, he's getting a brand new contract probably this offseason, and if you can keep a lot of these names on staff next year, you're going to be gunning for the college football playoff in the SEC And it's no longer the SC East. It's just two best teams. Best of luck to you. And everyone else kind of swallow on in behind. Number eight, Florida State. Florida State is undefeated. And I'm going to preface this before we go any further. Florida State wins out. They win on Saturday. I'm putting them in the college football playoff. They found a way to make up for the lost mistakes without Jordan Travis. Tate Rodemaker was far from perfect. But you know what? Everyone else stepped up. Everyone else played up to their standard and everyone else delivered so that way Rudemaker didn't have to be the only ace in the hole. Think about it. Trey Benson, phenomenal day. Three rushing touchdowns. Made it his most when he was in the red zone. Johnny Wilson, 64 yards. Shaheem Bell, 38 yards. And this defense, again, I'm going to continue to say this until I'm blue in the face. The defense is not getting enough respect down in Tallahassee. This is a team that had to play without knowing what their starting quarterback was like. Because Florida, they also were without a back. They also were on their backup. But you don't really know much, almost anything, about Max Brown. Max Brown this season played, if I'm not mistaken, in three games. That was it. And he was average at best, and most of it was in the fourth quarter. And you found a way to hold him to under 100 receiving, 100 passing yards, and you force an interception late. You got to win. I don't trust that you're going to be able to hold your own against Louisville entirely, but maybe I'm wrong, and I hope I'm wrong, because Florida State should not be penalized because of a quarterback. This team has weapons, future NFL talent, and enough inertia to be able to say to the college football community, we belong in the Final Four, no doubt about it. But if you ask me right now, where would I say they could stack up against the other seven teams? I think they lose by at least a a touchdown, if not more. Speaking of number seven, I have Ohio State. I don't trust Kyle McCord. I'm sorry. I don't. I think Kyle McCord is a very sound player. I think Kyle McCord did his job for most of the regular season. But without Marvin Harrison Jr., Ohio State probably loses to Penn State. Without Marvin Harrison Jr., Ohio State probably loses by double digits to Michigan. Ohio State, unfortunately was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Their defense couldn't get enough stops in the fourth quarter to go ahead and get clock back on their side. And lo and behold, now they're sitting at 11 and one. Ryan Day is one and three all time in the game. And there's questions, there's concerns. A lot of people don't realize it's a one game schedule for Ohio State and Michigan. They want to win the game. And if you lose that game and you lose it three years in a row, there's going to be a hot seat for you. 
Do I agree? No. I think Ryan Day is a top 10 coach in college football. And I think a lot of people would also stand on that. But at the same time, this game means more than the Big Ten Championship. This game means right up there with the national title. In a college football playoff semifinal, they would rather you lose that and win against Michigan. And you haven't done that for three straight years. So Ohio State's in a little bit of trouble. They're going to lose a lot of talent to the NFL this offseason. Here's the good news. It's Ohio State. They replenish. They basically grow on trees, the type of talent that you need for a football team in the NFL. They'll be fine next year. But you do have questions going into what will be potentially a defining season for Ryan Day. Six, Texas. Texas single-handedly put the whooping of a lifetime on Texas Tech. And they were playing with animosity, and they were playing with a little bit of a grudge, and well, they should. Because you want to know why? Brett Yormark in August said, hey, Joey McGuire, go handle business in Austin on a Friday afternoon. Go ahead and knock Texas down a notch. We don't want them representing the Big 12 and the CFP. In fact, we'd rather anybody else besides Oklahoma and Texas to do that. The way that they played, in my opinion, was if I were to say, hey, describe Texas football when it's at its finest, I point to that game. You had multiple touchdowns, whether it be on the ground or through the air offensively. You had a special teams touchdown by Keelan Robinson to kick off the second half. You had an interception by Jet Bush that went the other way for a pick six. You found a way to corral and hold this rushing attack led by, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, like him. Uh, you had to found a way to wear the special by Taj Brooks held it to 3.9 yards per play, three turnovers in the game. This was a game defining moment, in my opinion, for Steve Sarkeesian. The culture is exactly where you want to be at this point if you are the Longhorns. Now, you just have to handle business and hope someone else doesn't. That's really what this comes down to. Five, Alabama. I'm going to preface this one more time because I get comments on Twitter. I get comments in the YouTube section. In a head-to-head -head matchup, that team in week two does not exist in Tuscaloosa anymore. Jalen Milrow has completely revamped his entire career, and you've started to see what makes him work. And because of that, I think Texas would lose to Alabama at a neutral site location head-to-head. -head. Texas would get in the college football playoff over Alabama. I'm sorry, they would. I'm an Alabama I'm an Alabama grad. I stand on that. They would get in the CFP before Texas. I mean, before Alabama. But Alabama, they found a way to win. And they found a way to go ahead and punch their ticket to Atlanta at 11-1. and And it's the Iron Bowl. Crazy stuff happens in, in Jordan-Hare Stadium. Like, it's a voodoo wonder trap. That's what you have there. And they found a way to get momentum in the final drive. Mistakes occurred. Countless horrendous mistakes that Nick Saban probably was already about ready to have a pulmonary, pulmonary embolism on the sidelines. That occurred. And 4th and 31, the magic struck. It just struck for the other team. Not the Auburn team that resides in Jordan-Hare Stadium. And they're undefeated. I mean, they're, they're, they're undefeated in conference play. They have one loss in Texas. And if they beat up on Georgia... You might have to have a serious conversation. Do we put both Alabama and Georgia, I mean, both Alabama and Texas in the CFP? Or the discussion. Four, for me, this is Oregon. Oregon is the most consistent team. Oregon, regardless of circumstances, regardless of location, regardless of what time of day they're playing at, they find a way to win. And they did so on Friday in the final Civil War. Plain and simple. It was a good overall performance when it comes to Bo Nix. 33 or 40 passing, 9.2 passing yards, two touchdowns, ran for another, averaged five yards per play on the ground, over 360 passing yards. Defensively, you forced DJ Uyengale to throw an interception. You won the uh, you won the time of possession. You won the first down. You were better on third down. You finished with almost 250 more, I mean, almost 220 more yards of offense than them. You had fewer turnovers. You had fewer mistakes. You were good. You've been consistent. You've handled the business every single week. And again, mistakes unfortunately occurred late against Washington, but you can make the argument that you're right up there with Washington. And I don't doubt that at this point, if Oregon does defeat Washington in Las Vegas, whether or not I think Washington deserves a spot in the playoff, Oregon certainly does too. Three, Washington. You're skating by. You're skating by, but you know what? It doesn't really matter. You're undefeated. You've handled yourself. You found ways to win in different functions. Michael Penix Jr. didn't have to throw for 500 yards. You still found a way to get the victory in the Apple Cup. You trusted your defense to go ahead and play up to par at times. It was struggling, 
And thank God you have a reliable kicker because sometimes that could be the difference of you finishing undefeated or not. But you did so. 24-21, big time day for Penix when it came to the passing attack. Running game still pretty efficient. You know, Dylan Johnson, 82 yards, found his way into the end zone. I like this team. They've done their job. They've handled exactly what was asked of them. There's no reason why we should be having an argument that they're this year's TCU. And by the way, TCU did the same thing last year, and they still got in the CFP. If you win on Friday night, congratulations. Washington's going to the playoff. Two, Michigan. Michigan has not had their head coach for three games. They've won all three. This was the toughest part of their schedule. You didn't have an elite performance from J.J. McCarthy. Didn't really need to. You just needed to make sure that in the right situations, you were coming out on top. You watch as the run game was efficient. And then when Zach Center goes down, guess what? That's a moment where you panic. Nope. Instead, Blake Quorum scoots his way into the end zone, throws up the 6-5 in honor of his teammate that's fallen. They're well-built. They're well-equipped. They're found. They're soundly depth. They have everything at their disposal. And the best part is that you watch them win a football game in Harbaugh fashion, gritty, physical, and outworking you. And because of that, they're built like a championship team. They win on Saturday against Iowa. There's no denying that they're the number two seed. Plain and simple. And if they win on Saturday, the only question you have left is, will they find a way to mess this up again when it comes to the CFP? Because they've done this the last two years. The problem is that right before the finish line, they trip and they can't finish the race. Number one is Georgia. Georgia struggled again a little bit when it came to Georgia Tech. I get it. There's going to be people out there that say, well, how is Georgia Tech an okay balance? Well, here's the reason why. Because Georgia also struggled with Auburn, and Auburn struck, and Auburn nearly beat up on Alabama. So I'm not going to hold that against them. You still won by over a touchdown. Carson Beck threw an interception. He only finished with 175 yards. But you showed that you were consistent in areas of the game. If you knew that you were struggling in one spot, you didn't hang your wagon to it. You didn't go ahead and say, well, let's just run this into a ground until, until we're finally dead and beating the horse. You said, okay, run game, run game, run the damn ball. Three rushing touchdowns. You averaged roughly about 6.7 yards per play. Kendall Milton had 156 yards. Dejon Edwards found the end zone once. You're going to need a better performance, especially offensively and in the run when you face off against Alabama, because this could be a back and forth showdown. But you are the one team I think that can contain Bama right now. You are the one team that I think can handle business against Nick Saban because you've done it before. Kirby Smart knows what's going on inside the mind of the former of his former boss. They get it. They understand what's happening. I absolutely believe that even though Georgia barely squeaked by, we can go ahead and say it's true. They at times were struggling. They still won. And they are the best team in college football, even though you could say, well, they're not completely battle tested. You squeak by against a team like Auburn. You beat up on Missouri. You beat up on Ole Miss. You found a way to win against Georgia Tech late in the year. Now just handle business against Alabama and you're in. So there you have it. My top 10 teams in college football this week. Number one, Georgia. Number two, Michigan. Number three, Washington. Number four, Oregon. Number five, Alabama. Number six, Texas. Though Texas will beat Alabama in the head-to-head. Number seven, Ohio State. Number eight, Florida State. Number nine, Missouri. And pulling up the re- 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 pulling up the rear, Lane Train, Ole Miss Rebels. The powder blue and hottie toddy is riding high into my top Thank you so much 10. for watching that video. Don't hit the X button yet. Make sure you hit subscribe to keep up with all of our daily content found on Just Saying It and anything else that we post on this channel. Bye.